Hello and welcome to Birds as Markers of Change. I'm Julia Best and I'm a lecturer at Cardiff University. So I would often talk about some of my favourite species such as the lovely puffin, the regal gannet or the now extinct great auk. But today I want to go off onto a slightly different area to a group of species that perhaps overlooked in some situations and I want us to consider gulls. Yes, that terror of the British seaside, those infamous chip stealers. We have multiple different species of gulls in Britain and I want to look at what they could potentially tell us using a case study in the Scottish islands. So we're going to be focusing on a case study on the island of South Uist in the Outer Hebrides where you can see my black arrow and this site is called Bornish. We're going to be considering some seasonal and period based changes in bird use and situating the birds briefly within their wider temporal and locational context. And through this, I want to start to consider the modern potential of archaeological bird material. So South Uist um, has a very varied landscape. There's mountains and hills and sea locks to the east. There's a band of acidic peatland down the middle of the island and then over to the west where you can see this green band on my photographs lies the Macca, a fertile coastal plain which slopes gently to the sea. The Bornish you can see indicated here is a late Iron Age uh, and Norse settlement comprised of several mounds and um, this is currently the largest bird bone assemblage that has been analysed from the Outer Hebrides. In Mound 2 and 2a from Bornish there are lots of gull species. Gulls, when grouped together, are the largest component of the avian assemblage, followed by birds such as cormorant, another important seabird, and geese are also important. You can see though from these charts that there are a wide range of bird species present in the assemblages. And this fits a picture that we see in the Hebrides in the Norse period, where there is a diversification of fowling to include more waterfowl, such as geese and ducks, but also more wading birds, such as plovers, oyster catchers and curlews. Um, we can also see that domestic fowl are making up a fairly significant proportion of the assemblage of 7 and 8% at these two mounds in Bornish. But the main body of the uh, avian assemblage of bones comes from wild species. Um, we could talk about chickens for a day, so we're not going to touch on them particularly here, but we will encounter them again slightly later on. And a nearby site, Kilfeda, also Norse, also sees this pattern of diverse use of resources um, with a focus on one or two particular key species that seem to have been targeted uh, more repeatedly and be a major component of the avian resources. At Bornish, interestingly though, we seem to see a decline in gulls. So we have multiple species, the herring gull, the lesser backback gull and the great backback gull. In the Iron Age, gulls form nearly two thirds of the nisp. Um, uh, but in the Norse period from this mound one, they dropped to 40%. In the small assemblage we got from Mount 3 at Bornish, they are still an important component but only form about 24% of the avian nisp. In our biggest assemblages from Mount 2 and 2a, we can see in a little bit more detail that by the later Norse material, the goal frequency has dropped quite significantly to be about 6% of the bird nisp. So we're seeing this decline from the Iron Age through to the later Norse period. And at nearby Kilfeda, another Norse site, we see a similar thing where goals are important and um, usually comprise about 18% of the NISP in the earlier phases, but by the later phases are comprising between 11 and 4%. So why is this? Numerous theories have been put forward. Potentially, this is a response to um, increased usage of the maca, maybe animals grazing upon it and disturbing the birds, many of whom would have liked to have bred on the macca, and in particular the lesser blackback and the herring gull. It could be the pressures of intensive culling, 
Um, they're also uh, a key species at another Iron Age site nearby called Dunvillain. So if these birds have been exploited for quite some time, maybe this decline is in fact a result to culling. Or could it be the destabilisation of the delicate maca environment caused by an increase of human and other animal activities upon it, such as grazing and farming? No definite answers here, but one thing that's interesting to note is that comparatively, great blackback gull increases and lesser blackback gull and heron gull seem to decrease in the Norse period. Um, and great blackback gull is the gull that be less likely to breed upon the maca and more likely to breed on rocky areas of the shore. So perhaps this is a response to a change in the gull makeup of the population with herring gulls and lesser blackback gulls maybe being more impacted than greater blackback gull and their relative proportions changing. This is some preliminary eggshell work um, using proteomics which here is showing representation of context with particular eggshell species identified. It's important to note here that we, um, the proteomics work has been developed since this and we would like to revisit this information. But in red, we can see the Iron Age. And in the Iron Age, the eggs predominantly come from wild species. And in particular, these are gulls and orcs. So things like razorbill, puffin, guillemot. And we also have quite a few duck eggs in the Iron Age. Maybe a couple of chicken eggshell fragments, but we think this is now probably intrusive or um, uh, we need to revisit some of the markers. But what we can see is during the Norse phases, there is an explosion of chicken eggshell proportionally. And so with that combined with the fact that the gull and other wild bird eggs seem to be exploited less, maybe it is in fact preference. Maybe it's not something like destabilisation of the maca or increased pressure on these gulls. Maybe it's that in fact the gulls were not being targeted so heavily for certain resources because instead we have domestic birds such as the chicken coming in and providing eggs. So lots of different lines to investigate. Many of the birds could have been found close to the settlement um, but we have juvenile bones um, showing that resident species such as various waterfowl and also gulls were being used at multiple points of the year and so therefore may have been got from multiple different landscapes depending on what point of the year they were caught at. Approximately 6% of the Mound 2 assemblage and 11% of the Mound 2A assemblage were birds such as the gannet, the guillemot and the razorbill that probably weren't accessible close to the site. They only come to land to breed and are colony breeders which prefer cliff nesting sites. And you should go and see Adam Markham's Twitter thread on gannets. Uh, we do love gannets. Interestingly, at Bornish, we have quite a lot of juvenile gannet bone, potentially indicating that um, these birds were being taken from nesting sites that may have been some distance to the site. So while species as the gulls might give us an insight into what is happening in the very close vicinity of the site, we can tell from the avian resources that a range of different niches um, were being exploited for these birds and probably at a variety of different points of the year. So that was very, very quick and I could have talked to you about any number of species. Birds are such an embedded part of life in several environments, both past and present. And this has just been one really tiny example of where we can look at past variations to perhaps find stimuli that resonate with current concerns. Maybe that's to do with human exploitation and preferences there. Maybe it's to do with environmental um, fragility of certain landscapes. I could have chosen many other species such as the gannet or the great orc and explored similar and different stimuli. And it shows perhaps the versatility and the importance of bird information for investigating these concerns. I won't lie, it is hard and limitations of ID such as separating um, species or and equifinality of interpretation always going to be an issue. But by integrating as many different lines of evidence as we can, such as eggshell, seasonal interpretation, species ID, things like medullary bone, in combination with historical documentation and modern ecological mapping, we have the potential to hopefully understand these birds both past and present more holistically make some suggestions as to why we see what we do 
and maybe make recommendations as to how we interact with these birds and their landscapes in the future. Thank you to lots of people. Um, there's some links below the video if you're interested in having more bird facts than you could probably ever want to know. Um, and don't let the seagulls steal your chips.